to that place there, just like uh, the prophet of God prophesied uh, he, that he would use, Brother Souther. Yes. And Brother Shelton uh, stayed down around Homestead and Cairo and Mound City and all that section down there. And he then, led of the Lord, uh, God gave him a, a dream and a witness, and he was an uneducated man. Bob Shelton was probably a fourth or fifth grade education. And God said to him, go to Jerusalem. I'm going to use you there. And Bob Shelton began to trust God. He said, I can't speak their language. Me go to Jerusalem? How am I going to get there? Where's the money coming from? Me down here in poor little part of the country? And God provided the money. God provided the ship. Didn't have planes flying over there then. Come on. Uh, this has been the 19, uh, 18, 1919. And uh, he went to Jerusalem. He went to there and stood, and he just stood at the port at the boat until someone, and stood there and prayed until someone came. That's it. Thank you for filling that in. I left that out. Uh, he went down to the port uh, that he left out on, and he stood there on the dock and said, Lord, you said for me to go to Jerusalem. I can't get there. I don't have any money. I can't buy a ticket to get there. And a stranger walked up to him and said, you want to go to Jerusalem? I'll, take, I'll, I'll buy the ticket. You want to go? I'll provide the way. Now, brother, there's something back there that we don't see today. It's got to come back because we need it now. In a game-saved world, it wants to make you an unbeliever. It makes you want to doubt. We've got to come back to something more than we're seeing in the church right now. Have a personal experience with God that nobody can rob you from. Nobody can take it from you. Amen. He got on that boat, went to Jerusalem. He said, now I don't know what I'm going to do when I get there. How, where am I going to stay? I can't speak the language. He walked down the gangplank, stood there. He said, I stood in America. I'll stand here. All of a sudden, he began to speak in another language. <laughs> a porter run up to him and said, something in his language, took the bags, said, come get in this taxi. Put him in a taxi. Taxi driver began to speak to him. He couldn't understand. He began to speak back. And he couldn't understand what he was saying. And that taxi driver took him to a hotel. <laughs> took him, and the clerk talked to him. He talked back. Another, this stranger had given him money in America. And he had money. Bought him a hotel room. Conversed in a language. Couldn't say a word in that. Couldn't talk to them until the Holy Ghost came on him. Seven years he stayed there. Preached the gospel in Jerusalem by the language of God coming upon him. Never learned the language, never spoke, nobody ever taught him. And the day the Lord said, I'll not be with you here anymore. The work is done. Go back to America. God provided the way for him to go back. He gathered people. They had the Holy Ghost falling in Jerusalem. God. Jerusalem. Yes. Back there in 1919, 1920, uh, up through the 20s, the Holy Ghost fell. Bob Shelton planted the church of believers in Jerusalem. Thank you, Jesus. And the strange thing was it that today, if you go to Israel and you open a church and put uh, the sign out, Christian Church, the national law of Israel forbids the teaching and proselyting of, uh, by the Christian faith openly of Judaism. They forbid it. It's a national law. But then there wasn't one arrest made of this man for seven years he was there. Nobody bothered him. The Holy Ghost was with him. The Holy Ghost was over him. Praise the name of the Lord. Came back to this country. After being there seven years. Thank you, Jesus. My something, something back there worked, and something ought to work today. That's it. 
And I believe if we believe God, if we just keep reaching, if we keep praying, keep living, uh, sanctifying, setting apart, striving to be one, striving to be together, somewhere the veil is going to split again, as it did in those days. And we'll get these gifts back in us, back among us, these gifts. These gifts. Because Jesus Christ was in that Old Testament. He was in the Old Testament. He manifested himself in different ways. Uh, he was actually the tree that was put in the waters to make the bitter water sweet. Uh, he was the tree. There was some natural tree that was cut down, that Moses cut down to put in the waters and made them sweet for Israel to drink. It was Jesus. He just stepped into the water because he was there. He was the angel of God's presence. He has to come back and witness himself again in whatever way he has for the church before he's coming, before his advent. If he was the angel of God's presence in the Old Testament, he's got to be again evident. If the last thing that John saw in the book of Revelation, uh, in what is it, uh, chapter 4, chapter 3, chapter 2, the early chapters of Revelation, he saw him walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Yes. He saw the Son of God walking in the mist. He was in the mist of those seven churches. And he's got to be back in the mist of the church today. My God. He has to be in the mist of my God, my God. Somewhere we've got to see Jesus more than we're seeing him yes. now. Because it's good what we feel, what we see now. But there is a lack of the job being done and the work being finished. Thank you, Jesus. Sister Mona. Two, one. Uh, Revelations 2 and 1, is it? Mm -hmm. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah. Seven, yeah. If Brother Shelton and, and Brother Salvers ever get together again after... The strange thing, and this has happened more than once, in that way God leads apostles and prophets. Bob Shelton came back to this country. Brother Souders had advanced and where he was reaching thousands of people. He had left Armstead, left all the familiar places Bob knew. And Bob came back, and he'd been away from Brother Souders for seven years. And when he came back, he went to the campground at uh, Shepherdsville, Kentucky. And uh, Brother Souders had bought that land and had started the campground there. And there were people coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. This man that ordained him, this man that had that marvelous gift in his life, apparently became angry at Brother Souders because Brother Souders had, was reaching people and Bob had no one. When he came back to this country, the anointing had left him. He was no longer in that gift and he apparently I'm not judging I don't know but something happened in his spirit and during a song service uh, he took a, one of these Winston folding songbook that you know we used to have in the church you can fold them together not the hardback <coughs> the other kind and he walked up to the Souders and he slapped him in the face. Slapped him. Slapped him again. And he said, you have missed God. You have missed God, William Souders. You have missed God. And Brother Souders took the slap and he said to the people, I want, Brother, I want you to honor this man. This man is a great gift of God. This man is my apostle. This man is to be honored. Let no one speak evil of him. No one. That was William Souders. He was fulfilling. 
He was Heard me? I'm just thinking. No, go ahead. That's all right. I was just thinking. He was fulfilling the, the prophecy that Brother Shelton gave over him. Yes. He was influencing thousands, you know. He, he prophesied that he would, and he was. Brother Souders was fulfilling the very prophecy that William Souders gave. I mean, uh, uh, Brother Bob Shelton gave. Brother Souders was fulfilling that prophecy that Bob gave. Exactly the same. Bob, he said, I want Bob to go down and fix him a special place at the table. I want to eat with him. And he said, I want to be sure that Brother Bob has the best of food. And I won't eat till he eats. Bob wouldn't do it. He left the campground in that spirit. He died in Southern Illinois without a following. He died alone. Um, hardly anyone but his family there. And Brother Souders went to the service. And Brother Souders wept. Mm. Wept over his grave he was such a prophet of God and he said as David said rejoice tell it not among the Philistines lest the Philistines rejoice that Saul has been slain that you know what that tells me and I, I know now by the scriptures because I read the scriptures and I know what the scripture teaches you'd better stay Somewhere where your eyes can see two things. Never let the wrong spirit get a hold of you. Oh, yes. And cause you yes. to miss God yes. in your anger, My sure. in your wrath, or in your jealousy, whatever it is. Yes. And then always, always stay close enough to God where you will not see God today. And then not see him at all in the next move God makes. That's what happened to Bob Shelton. Whatever there was, and he's not the first man, he's not the only man. No. See, God moved with Saul and David that way. Yeah. God sent David to Saul. Yeah. And David would have stood by Saul and fought Saul's battles. And but yet Saul turned all together against David. But he didn't in the beginning. That's it. He, he loved David yes, in the beginning. He, he asked David to bring the harp yes. and play for him soothe his spirit. and soothe his spirit. Jesus. But his spirit reversed itself. And I've seen that happen. In my day, I've seen men that saw the truth. I've seen men of God that saw the truth, <coughs> that preached the truth, that were anointed of God. And they turned around, and another spirit took Jesus, them. yes. I've seen people of God in the church do that. My God. That they saw the truth, My God. and in the end, they became angry. God. Denounced. Thank you, Jesus. Saying evil for the very thing they spoke good of in the beginning. My God. I tell you two things. Keep your spirit with God. Yes. My God. And watch and pray. Oh, and say, Lord, let me see every move you make, whether it's in the sunshine or the shadows, let me see. Because that great man of God, Bob Shelton, that was used of God so greatly for some reason. Jesus. Unknown only to God, I don't know. No. I don't know. But it turned away oh. and that's true. So it, it shows you, though, a lesson that's really there in the scriptures, too. It's in the scriptures, as well as that example. Um, anyone else with a comment or a thought on this? Brother, I got a kind of an answer to where Brother Bibbins Bibb Bibb pretty close. Yeah. Anyway, he would ask him, well, what would they speak? And I think he was referring to what dialect. Uh, in the beginning, when the Bible doesn't refer much, but I believe uh, when Abraham came, it came out the armory. We know that the uh, Bible talked about the Old Testament written in armory, but which is probably Jewish. 
it didn't come till I believe till he told to, to him he wanted to take him to another place, uh, and I, well, I believe that's when the language of the Jews changed. It, th that I was just trying to give him some answer to his dialect. He I think I think I gave him the answer, um, Brother Bibbins. Let's go back to what I said to you. Uh, you asked what dialect, what what language. Yeah. Um, the only language that Adam could have spoken was a pure language. Yeah. And the language was never pure after the fall. Yeah. It was an impure language because it came from an impure man. Sure. And so the language that he spoke had to be a pure language. And the language that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongue of men, and that's the imperfect. Right. Tongue of men is the imperfect. And of angels. I see, I believe that Adam spoke um, the, the, um, the same language that angels spoke because angels uh, were equal to uh, man and he was a little less than angels. He was just a little less. Well, I want that scripture. I'm trying to grasp it there. No, no, in Psalms. Um, uh, Psalms 8. What is man? Psalms 8. What is man? That thou art mindful of him. See, what is man? Thou hast made him a little lower. A little lower than the angels. A little lower? Yes, he was on the earth. Angels were in the heaven. A little lower. But he was as pure as any angel in heaven was before he sinned. Man was as pure as any angel in the heavens because he had no sin. See, thou hast crowned him with glory and honor. That was before man sinned. What is man? that thou art mindful of him. Thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. You made him with a terrestrial body. You made the angels with a celestial body. Thou hast crowned him with glory and with honor. So if he was a little lower than the angels, thou hast made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. That was in his perfect state. All sheep and oxen, yeah, and the beast of the field. That was in his perfect state. See, I, I believe God, you know, um, all of you dear saints of God, you men of God, I believe the scriptures, I, the scripture said, iron sharpeneth iron. The book of Proverbs, iron sharpeneth iron. I believe the word of God proves itself. I believe when you're searching for an answer to the scripture, get another scripture. Yes. Yes. Reach for another scripture. Yes. Because there's another scripture that will sharpen that scripture. Iron will sharpen iron. Yes. If you've got a scripture that's a mystery, ask the Holy Ghost to lead you. And it'll lead you to another scripture. Yes. Just like what language did they speak? Well, we know that Brother Dale said the thousands of dialects, the thousands of languages. In India alone, in India alone, there's 33,000 gods in India. How many languages is there in India? Thousands of dialects. Well, that's an impure language. That, that, that I can't get that scripture in the Old Testament. I can, bouncing around it as I'm talking that he will return unto them a pure language. He had it also. Oh, you have it now. Yes, right here on the board. Brother David's keeping right with me and going ahead of me. And that's great, David. I love that. For then will I turn to the people, then will I turn to the people a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent, a pure language. So the language that I have is not pure, 
if the Holy Ghost doesn't control my tongue, I don't control my spirit, and I don't stay in the Holy Ghost, I'm capable of saying some very good words. And you are too. Each one of us is. Because we have an imperfect language. We have an imperfect body, mind, tongue. But God keeps us in purity through the Holy Ghost. He sanctifies us. Now he's going to turn to the people a pure language in that day, that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one consent. I believe, I believe that the iron sharpened the iron. I believe that in, in answer to the question we're seeking here, and uh, Brother Dale said, we all know that there are many dialects in the world. What language, Brother Vivian said, what language did they speak with? Paul said, though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels. But you don't speak with the tongue of angels till the Holy Ghost empowers you. The Holy Ghost has to, you can't do it yourself. If you do, you're faking it. If you just, and I've, I've seen that in my day. I don't know if you have or not, but I've seen that in my day. That where people, the Spirit revealed to me, they were not speaking in the pure language of the Holy Ghost. right. I've seen people rebuke people, supposedly, with another tongue, and you could tell it was anger in that person. Yeah. Yeah. That was against the other person. Yeah. 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 They had a running battle. Yeah. Yes. They were rebuking them in their spirit, and trying to get the people to feel it was the Holy Ghost. I've seen that in my day. I was in a church turning out when they turned 15 people out of the church, no, 21 people out of the church at one time yes. for fellowshipping another church. Yes. Right. That's the reason they turned them out. Yes. And when they turned them out, this uh, one man went around a pole in the middle of the building, supposedly speaking in tongues, shaking his hand in the face of these others, and he, he, he was speaking in some tongue, but you could feel anger in that building. You could yes. feel people against one another. The Holy Ghost was grieved. So uh, that wasn't pure, but there's a pure language from God, the gift of tongues. When uh, other tongues are given as a gift so it can convince the people to believe, when cloven tongues are given, th that's pure language. That's, that's of God. That's my thought of it. Uh, that's just my thought. Uh, so... And I never, I lose track of time when we're in these subjects like this, brother and sister. Okay, it says in the third chapter of Genesis 8, and they heard the voice of the Lord God. So he was talking directly to them. It had to be a pure language. It had to be a pure language. They heard the voice, didn't they? The of the Lord God. They heard the voice of Jesus. That was the Lord God. That wasn't uh, Jehovah that his father, that was Jesus, the Lord God. And they heard his voice. How did they understand him? If it wasn't that they understood pure language that was spoken in heaven as well as in the earth. Thought, consider it. I'll listen, I'll listen to anyone with any other comments on it. I mean, I, I don't. Was there any Yeah, there was a there was probably I'm thinking from the names I've heard called. I've forgotten some of the names. Uh, there was Brother Casper. Uh, I remember Brother Casper. I saw Brother Casper. I uh, came to El Dorado when I was there as a young man. Brother Casper loved a little dog. If 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 if, if his little dog couldn't sleep in the house, he wasn't sleeping in the house. If you invited Brother Casper in the house and you said to Brother Casper, stay all night, and you said to the dog, stay outside, Brother Casper said, no, I'm staying outside. The dog can't come in the house, I'm not coming. That was one of his little peculiarities. But Brother Casper was an anointed man of God. He wouldn't, he wouldn't, um, he didn't work. He said the Lord told him to go about the country preaching the gospel. Jesus. He preached the gospel from filling stations to street corners 
to brush arbors, to one or two, to a policeman on the beat. He'd just walk up and start preaching. He'd take a tour and start walking down through a city to another village through the day preaching. And somebody give him something to eat, he'd eat. If he didn't, they wouldn't eat. And he, he just trusted God for whatever he had. Um, and uh, he lived an itinerant life. He was on the gospel boat. Brother Frank Knight, he came and stayed, and stayed in our home in Bradenton when I was a boy with Brother Roberts. Brother Frank Knight did. He was blind, but he could see. He was blind, but he could see. Right. You walk in a room, Brother Knight, watch out. You're going to walk into that door now. You watch out, Brother Knight. You don't tell him that. Let him walk in a room. He never walked in a door, into a door, never walked into a chair, uh, but he was blind. But God gave him a sense of, of feel, and and he could prophesy in the Holy Ghost and electrify the church with his prophecy. Frank Knight. Uh, that was two. By Shelton, his brother Bob was one. And Bob, he came to Anna, remember Sister Ethel? While I was there pastoring the church on a Sunday night. And he could he could make your flesh crawl. When he started talking about being ungodly and being a sinner and being against God and running from God, and he'd describe hell and he'd describe a man in hell in the torments and uh, judgment, and, and he got down on the floor. I remember there in Anna, he got down on the floor and he was like a worm squirming. And he said, this is the man in the hot ashes. God's judgment. God, angry, shaking a sinner over a broken rail of eternity. He would sit there and hear him. He had a powerful voice. He was a little man, but he had a powerful voice. God, uh, by, uh, by shelter. Uh, so I remember a lot of those people, and their, their names were called. So there was probably 15 to 20 people on that boat at one time. It was a rather large boat. Brother Souders, you know, had the blues chaser built. Only it was a it was a pleasure boat, but the, he, that was his boat, the Blues Chaser, and Brother Souders was a river man. He loved the river, and I was at Olmstead, the last meeting Brother Souders ever came to, and he had the men of the Louisville Church put him on the on the uh, Blues Chaser, and he no longer could pilot it. He wasn't able to steer it through down the river, but he came from Louisville, docked it at the foot of the camp meeting there at Olmstead. And we all went out of the tabernacle to hear him preach on the bow, or that is on the stern of the blues chaser. And uh, he talked to the people. The last uh, public talk I ever heard him make outside of the one at uh, Shepherdsville in June before he died in November. But he was, he was a man of God. And you could just feel God when he spoke um, because he was a man of God. And he wasn't the only man of God that lived in that day. And he, uh, and there's been men of God live before and after. Uh, Brother William Souders was a man, and he told you he was a man, but he was a man used of God. God does use men. God he uses angels. God uses angels. He uses men, and and he uses people that will surrender to him. You know, Brother Marla, I'd like to say something here. Uh, you know, you, you've been talking and you've been uh, preaching, you know, the last few months. You're talking about a change, about the churches and a change. <clears throat> yes. It's obvious, I mean, uh, a lot of people are seeing it. A lot of people are, are seeing yes, they what's are. going on. Yeah. They're seeing things being uh, changed and cleaned up, if you will. But as you were preaching there and you were talking about that, we've got to get, the church has got to get back to that point again to where where the Holy Ghost moves within it and, and, and the way that it moves. I think that as we work, as you work and, and, and keep going on the perfection of the church, I just hope and pray that someday that we'll see that that uh, manifestation and, and everything there. I, I long to see praise it. God. I, I would love to see it. I would love to live long enough to see it. I hunger after it. I thirst after it. You know, 
the battle's been long these 65 years. From, from uh, 17 to 82, it's been a long day. And it's been long for you if you've been among God's people. I'm longing to see. I'm longing to see the church leave where it is now and go into that place. It's been a long day. Jesus. I long to see people touch God again. I long to see what we had. See, you don't have to tell me about an experience. I was there. Someone said, I don't know if the church was so much different than it is now. Well, you can say that if you were not there. But I was there. I was there. And I can tell you it's as different as night from day what we're looking at now as the church as it was in the beginning. We, we have to hunger and thirst. Jesus. We have to be hungry. We have to be thirsty. Praise Give me water, O Lord. Let me drink, O Lord. Praise the name of Lord. Have you enjoyed the Bible study? Yes. Yes. You enjoyed the time. Thank you, choir, for holding up for us. But we, we are. I believe we were looking for something to They used to do back, you know, 60, 70 years ago, or maybe 80, but they didn't have enough of Bibles to go around. They had, they were really, God would call them, they didn't even know how to read. I no, many of them couldn't so say to ABC. God himself had to give them the ability God himself to, had to preach this. Yes. It was, we used to call it the old Brush Harbor days. Oh, yes, back oh, yes. See, it was those times. I mean, uh, let's go back that far. God had made a change that the Bible, Bibles, and we know everybody.